everybody. Hope you're having a great week. Uh, thank you so much for joining me here on this Wednesday. It's a little bit hey, early. Hope you're having a great week. Uh, okay, so the volume was on. So, hey, Todd, hey, Mike, and hey, John, good to see you. So, we are going with part five of this and, you know, trying out a new angle. So, we have different camera angles going, you know, this one, of course, with the water bottle in front. And we have the standard one. So, let me go ahead, even though it's not 930, let me remove this and also remove this so hmm let's see so we have that and where else part five okay let's see just have to remove part five let's do that let's see why is it still showing up Okay. Oh, part three. There we go. Okay, great. So now we are all set with the three camera angles. The first one, camera B, and then we have camera B large here, and then we have camera three right here for some really cool overhead shots. So I think that would be very interesting. Let me see if I could make the color a little better for you guys. Anything to make you experience better that's me you know how i am okay so and let's get rid of the saturation just a tad oh that's a little green so let's see if i could make it green so it is pretty close yeah that's pretty close okay because this thing is green so now it's green on the monitor so that is good Scott, how are you? Good to see you, my friend. Lee's here, all the way from the UK. Thank you so much, and great to see John and everybody, and Todd. Thank you so much. And so, let's go ahead. We'll go with camera one, the standard. And we are just going to... Oh, man, it's 2.30, so thanks for stopping by, my friend. That's for sure. 2.30 in the morning, that's burning the midnight oil, right? That's for sure. I have the medium mixture here in the airbrush, and today I think I'm going to... Hey, Patty, how you doing? Great to see you. So glad you can make it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, come in with the eraser and try and get some volume in, in Sama's hair a little bit. And then we're going to go in with the dark mixture, really hit those dark accents. And then we'll finish up with the uh, highlights. And that would be with the white pastel, of course, and the paper stuff. So that's good. So good to see everybody here on a Wednesday. Um, so it's getting a little chilly here in the, in the, uh, on the east, uh, east, northeast coast here, New York City area. We got down to the 40s, I think, the other night. Uh, that's Fahrenheit, guys, for my UK friends and Canadian friends out there who do Fahrenheit, you know. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Patty. Yeah, I did get galley representation uh, over the weekend, and that was really exciting. And thank you so much for all the wishes, and I really appreciate that, you know. Thank you for... For the congratulations on that, Patty. Thank you so much. Okay, so I have my aggressive eraser over here. Oh, and let's do the gloves. So what's really cool, in the description field, there's a link to my website, and I do carry these gloves. I have uh, I have uh, three pairs left, uh, two, medi uh, two small and one medium left. So uh, if you're interested, you just go ahead and click on that link in the description field and that's pretty cool so I can't do without these gloves because of the fact that they can leave quite a bit of hey Patrick good to see you oh thank you Lee I appreciate that 
Uh, so, Patrick, uh, thank you so much for stopping by. So I'm using this aggressive eraser by Faber-Castell. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try and pull out and almost like, a, you know, you want to do a quick like that, you know, like almost like a dagger stroke. And that's going to really help out a lot. See that? So I'm looking at the uh, reference and I'm doing the, you know, the one second rule, which is very important. Raul, how's it going? Good to see you. So we have a nice uh, group uh, building up here. So glad everyone can make it. So as you see, with those little dagger strokes, I can really uh, get very thin, thin hairs. And I want you to try and, try and really uh, make that happen. Yes, you do. That's true. And you get that sort of soft at the end, right, Lee? So that's very good. Oh, I'm so sorry about that, Mike. Mike's having trouble. And what I'm going to do is once I get these hairs, I'm going to come in with the medium mixture. And I'm just going to put some darks next to these lights with the hair because it only works when you have the contrast going you're right hey brad good to see you my friend so cool and just all over but you don't want to do long hairs because the hairs don't go all the way they kind of stop and other hairs stop and go in front of it so you really want to pay attention to what exactly is occurring And so you'll see that the hairs don't go, they kind of stop halfway. And then you can come in with this here. And sort of bring some darks into those hair masses. Just break up those hairs. Just like so. And, and then repeat that process as you go along, you know? Now there's so many different erasers. You can use your mono eraser. Give it a shot. Sometimes in this later stage it doesn't work as well. But I think in the dark area, it works pretty well, as you can see. Uh, and then you can, you know, do a variety of, you know, stray hairs here and there. And, you know, really go to town. Look, squint your eyes first and see those big shapes. Right? So if you squint your and you see how we're getting more detail and volume as we go. And Lee says, are you pushing the highlights back to give more depth? Definitely. And that's, you know, it's always, you know, putting in some hairs, darking them, lightening more and darking, and sort of create that volume of hair coming forward and going back. So you're creating hairs to push back, and then you're creating more hairs and, and so on. And it's, the thing is that I always teach is hair is so important to stick with. Like anything else that's complicated or complex, you want to stick with it, otherwise you'll lose out. So you don't want to run out of gas. And I usually don't do too much hair in the live streams because it's, as you can see, it's very time consuming. But I'm going to do a short area here just to show you guys, you know, how I develop the hair. And then, you know, we haven't even come in with the Fonz and Porter yet. And that will get those really, you know, really rich highlights which are coming. Mostly dark over here. So we're going to just 
really make this dark because then we'll come in with the smaller lights that are that are right around the corner, you know? Oh, so you do that with with fur, with animals. I, I haven't really done many animals in my career, so that's fascinating. I appreciate that insight. So we just we're just sticking with her hair right now, just for a little bit, and then I'll go back into her face and do things that are a little more quicker as far as showing technique. So I'm with the medium mixture guys. The airbrush I'm using is my own version of the Extreme Patriot Arrow. I made several modifications to make it even a better detail airbrush that I feel rivals the custom micron. So, you know, and uh, you know, if you're interested in getting uh, a micron or I'm sorry, an Extreme Patriot Arrow like mine, just go ahead and leave a comment or email me and I'll be happy to help you out and actually get you a 15% discount on it, you know? So right now we're working on this area and so we're going to re-establish some of those darks here and then we'll come back with the light light highlights and sort of bring depth back to her hair here now over here we have some some dark masses over here so let's make sure that we put them in there we go and you just continue working along these lines when it comes to hair. So, you know, the one second rule always applies, whether it's hair, whether it's a, an arm, or it's a highlight on the, on the pupil of her eye, it's just as important to go ahead and get as much, uh, much precision as possible when it comes to painting what you see. You can only paint what you see if you look first and then paint as opposed to just getting lost in the act of painting and then all of a sudden you know you're down the road you really shouldn't be down. And sometimes you'll get a little bit of overspray here uh, when it comes to uh, working with the hair and the larger masses and that's normal. I find a kneaded eraser is a very good uh, cover of you know of large areas as far as erasing and nice and nice and uh, even. So definitely, oh yes, uh, yes, Brad, I'm definitely using the medium mixture. So squinting my eyes, really seeing the larger shapes. Seeing where maybe I, uh, you know, missed some shapes in the early going and just trying to get them in correctly. Always constantly check your measurements. Make sure as you're going that you're really paying attention. And that's the difference really is just, you know, training your eyes and your hands to work together. Alexa, play stream sounds. Stream sounds, a tutorial on Amazon. So a little bit of uh, white noise in the background, never hurt anybody. So we'll just go ahead and put that there. Uh, no, my toilet's not broken, guys. <laughs> Right here. 
here, we'll see that, now I did just run out of medium mixture. So, you know, everyone always, uh, you know, it's always good to see that it's, it's very simple to change your mixtures. And let's see if we are on camera here. Okay, so, so here's my airbrush, right? And for me to change and, you know, get more ink, whether it's the medium mixture or light mixture, you just, this quickly, no mess, no dripping, no mediums, and so fast, you're ready to paint again as soon as I can find my the cap. Sometimes the cap rolls away, that's always fun. So I'll just take the cap from this one here. Where did the cap go? Interesting. Usually it falls into my drawer. So you see, right now I'm, I'm this quick back into the static, so to speak. <laughs> yes, it is a runny nose. <laughs> That's funny there, sir. Okay, great. So we're going to use this angle. I think this angle is probably best. Let's zoom in a little bit, get a little bit of clarity. So as you can see, you refine slowly. It's not a fast process, especially something with hair because there's a lot of it going in and going out. One second rule when it comes to your reference. And you can use your freehand shield to, you know, really get that edge if you need. And usually the rule is perpendicular and not parallel. Sometimes you will go parallel, and this would be one case in time. Actually, no, this is still perpendicular enough. Uh, you see how I can get a much harder edge when it comes to a hair mass. Because at first we're not painting individual hairs, but we're painting hair masses. Oh, great, Mike, that's good. So cool. So glad you're back, sir. Okay, so now I have the medium mixture in the airbrush. And what we can do is we could just start working on some things like her shirt right now with the medium mixture. It's nice and dark here, this, this sort of fold uh, right here. And of course, you can use your kneaded eraser, or in this case, your aggressive eraser to pull out some of the lights, just like that, and really complete that. So if you make sure you stick with the with the whole idea of the one second rule, things aren't that hard because you're just really paying attention to what you're seeing, but you're doing it uh, like you're looking for two seconds and then you paint for two seconds. And then you do the same thing. You look for a second and then you paint for a second. Look for two seconds and then you paint for two seconds. And it really keeps you in the game, but also 
helps you to solve the problems of things that look complex, but they're really not. So it's the, the laptop is slow. That well, I'm glad you're getting use out of it. Definitely, Mike. Now this is super dark right here. Right here is very light. Just an indication of the contour of her shirt here. I'm really looking first before I paint. Then get some sort of those weird shapes there and see how it just fades out. Just so when you're painting, make sure that you're really, really observing and looking, looking intently at what you're working on before you actually go ahead and and actually apply any paint to the paper or to the canvas or what have you. And then you can also look for gradations. Uh, my guest says last week when he said to use a lighter spring on his pack valve, he meant a cheap cigarette lighter spring from a flint. Oh, it's smaller and has a heavy pressure. Wow, that's very cool. Okay, that sounds even better there, uh, Mike. Definitely. That's a that's really great. Patty says, why do you use the cap on your why do I use the cap on your airbrush? Mine didn't come with a cap, just curious. This guy right here, uh, this one right here, Patty. Uh, and what airbrush do you have? I believe you have the Custom Micron, is that correct? Or the Sotar? I did see you with a Sotar in one of the pictures on your post. Uh, also, you have a Wada and a Sotar. Well, the thing is, I always uh, use a cap. And your airbrushes should have came with a cap, except for your side feed. That doesn't come with a cap. The Sotar should have came with a cap, I believe. Did you get the Sotar Slim, or was it the Sotar Regular 2020 with the cup like this? Now, the Sotar Slim is very small, and it doesn't come with a uh, cap, because it's just a very little uh, paint inside it. Now... The thing is, uh, Patty, I'm a, I paint uh, horizo uh, horizontally like this, right? And so you see the crazy angles I go at. And if I didn't, I would spill ink all over the place. So I'm not a good candidate for a side feed airbrush. So I sold my, all my side feeds. I do have a couple of Badger side feeds. But I only use them on larger pieces when I'm actually working vertically on the easel, you know? Oh, the Sotar Slim is an amazing airbrush. Steve, how you doing? Thank you so much, my friend. 
Uh, the Vega did come, uh, no, the Vega didn't come with a cap. I don't know if it comes with a cap uh, normally, but I, I got mine differently. So, uh, but the caps are real inexpensive on at Badger if you, but for your, for the Sotar 2020 Slim, there's no caps for those. But I appreciate that, Steve. Yeah, it doesn't. Anything like that, there's really no design of a cap for that because it only takes a couple of drops of ink. Now, one thing with the Sotar Slim Patty, you want to put one, two, maybe three drops of, of anything in there, anything more, and it could overflow. And that's with any of those, uh, you know, those type that just has no cup because it doesn't really take that much paint or ink for it to overflow so you want to be careful of that so Steve thank you so much it's good to see you my friend so again we're just uh, you know working on the masses here and then over here we want to really pay attention to any areas that we may have accidentally neglected so that's really cool to do uh, you don't want to neglect anything. We don't want to look like we ran out of gas in certain areas, so we want to make sure that we... Now, here's a really good tip. If you, you can get an Aztec side feed cup for your... Uh, let me go get it. It's in my other studio. I'm going to show you. It's really wild. I'll be right back. company testers made an airbrush called the Ax. Oh, thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate that. Called the Aztec. And the Aztec was a side feed airbrush. And they have, you can get these on Amazon. And they're the cups for the side feed, which they don't even make this, the airbrush anymore, but they still sell the cups. Now, this cup fits your, this cup will actually fit your, your, Micron SB so that's something to really think about because it has a cap so if you're going to be doing horizontal work that's your solution so it's the side feed the cup side feed cup for the Aztec by testers definitely look into that oh look at that Lee still has his Aztec 3000 from 1985 and it did have that side feed cup right still that's a very interesting airbrush, right? It really is. Do you still use it at all, Lee? Pretty soon we're gonna be coming in with the dark mixture. Uh, oh, cool. Three sizes for those cups. And this is her hand here. We're just going to paint that in. Now, it, you, it's not your stereotypical hand as defined. Is just an indication of her hand here. But with the one second rule, I'm going to make sure that I'm only painting what I'm seeing and not trying to make it look like a hand. That's where we get in trouble. When we try to make it look like a hand, we should just paint what we're seeing. And that's good enough. So that's what I'm concentrating on. And we can use our freehand shield to get a nice hard edge of his hair against the backdrop of her hand. So 
So Lee hasn't tried it for a while, but must take it out, right? And true, after all those years, I'm sure it does have some issues. And it's interesting how you could make a single action uh, do that, right? If you dial it in. And uh, I don't know if you ever heard of David Morton, but he was one of the first airbrush teachers I had. And just amazing what he could do with that. Have you seen him, David Morton, do his uh, magic with the Aztec? Just gonna extend this out a little bit. Extend this down. And over here, we'll just pull some air. air hair mass over here oh yeah me too some really great stuff hey Chris good to see you my friend how you feeling what's new Chris is in the house always good to see you my friend so let's pull in some of these light hair masses over here Just, it's a little light, and then we'll reiterate that with some darks. But you can see how this hair is very complex, and how we just have to take our time with that. Ah, oh, just another day. Oh, yeah, I hear you. Sometimes, especially Wednesdays, could feel like that, my friend. Am I right? Alexa said that uh, she felt that Wednesdays were, she seen them as the week is half full. <laughs> as opposed to half empty. Chris said he just got his order from Coast today, and you don't want to see how many stencils came. Wow, I love to see. That sounds great. That's like Christmas morning, right? That's pretty cool. What's your favorite that you got? Oh, so Lee has a few of those stencils too, I believe. And whenever you can feel that maybe you're getting overzealous and you can always just go ahead and, you know, just like little feathers, feather it and you can lighten any value that maybe you, you went too dark with, you know. So you see the freehand shield is very important for getting these layering. But I really implore you guys to always do the one second rule. It really keeps you from from getting lost, you know, and and then keeps your, your head in the game. And you really, you know, keep that layering happening and so you can get those darks that are sort of the hair goes in and then comes back out, and that sort of thing. And little by little you get there, you know, you get there when you get there when it comes to hair. Hey, that's a good Timism, right? You get there when you get there when it comes to hair. I should write that down. That's a good one. So, you know, hey, hey what's up, James? Good to see you, my friend. How are you? Now, we're just going to look for some darker hair masses over here. So I guess this is a, a good part of the live stream 
that is uh, really important to uh, just realize that you do have to stick with hair. You know, it's really crucial to not. Yes, that is one for the book of quotes. <laughs> <laughs> That's truly, I got a lot of them. They sort of happen over the years, you know? We're gonna, since I'm here, let me darken up. Uh, the zygomatic arch here. I think that's what it is. There we go. And then I can darken around here. here on there we go just try and put a little get a little bit more of her personality there we go that sort of really strong personality that comes out see when it comes to her hair, I mean her teeth, you really got to be careful and get that detail, but don't go crazy, right? You got to really sort of walk that tightrope. And pretty soon we're going to come in with that dark mixture, you know? Now, James says it really comes down to anatomy, and I really feel that's so true. Uh, if we don't pay attention to the anatomical uh, structures and the rules of anatomy, we definitely can get lost and just create something that just doesn't look right, right? So you have to be so careful of that. I have to be so careful of that, of course. Right over here, you just see a little indication of the cast shadow. And I'm going to be a good distance away, you know. So you see, I'm just going to hit that little bit of cast shadow of her hair. And just as it goes towards her nose, right here. So it's good to see this one angle, you know? Oh, thanks, Tone. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. My guest says, well, if you send new ones, I think you can put it on the dash of your car. Okay. <laughs> and so... You know, it's, it's really important to, uh, you know, continue moving around. You're in the medium mixture now, and the medium mixture is that one stage where you have to make sure that you don't go too strong because you could actually obliterate what you did with the light mixture. So subtlety is really important. And the medium mixture, you should almost use like you would uh, you know, a cadmium red if you were painting. You wouldn't use it that much. You would use it in everything, but not much, you know. Uh, Chris says he's not happy. He ordered on September 11 and just got it today and has a piece on the board and now the stencil, oh no. Oh boy, the stencils are messed up. That's horrible. Hey, Patrick. So Patrick says, oh, thank you, sir. I really appreciate that. Uh, so, you know, you guys are really very, uh, how do you say, always very supportive and everything. So, thank you guys. Um, 
And I think if you, uh, I would actually contact uh, Dave Monning if you're Facebook friends with him. I'm sure he would want to want to fix that for you, Chris. You know. Uh, let's go ahead. And we're gonna move into the dark mixture and hit some of those really dark highlights. Yes, that's that's a beautiful piece. It's gonna come out nice. Remember, you just have to, as you know, you have to stay as light as possible for as long as possible, creating edges and making sure that you're able to get those variations of uh, hard and soft edges as you go. Okay, so this is the dark mixture. Let's see, where is the dark mixture? Believe it or not, I'm running out of dark mixture, so I'm going to go into the uh, ink room and get myself some dark mixture. So that's funny. I'm running out of dark mixture. Okay, so here we are. Now we have the dark mixture, and let's make sure we load this other Extreme Patriot Arrow modified by me. And of course, those who have also recently know this is the new design for the ink mixtures as far as the bottle comes. It has a really nice built in eyedropper, which I love. And it's much safer in shipping and much more compact for you guys. And so it's really cool. So let's see. Okay, so here's a dark mixture. And it's so important to have the cap, more so if you're working horizontally like me, you know? Hey Bradley, how's it going? Good to see ya. Bradley Smith's in the house. And Todd's here, that's good. How you doing, sir? All right, so let's adjust this a little bit. You know, with the pack valve, which is wonderful, you get to adjust that. And now we can make sure I get my reference front and center, you know? Okay, so I have my Salma here, and we are going to really start hitting some of these dark accents here, which are really going to make a difference. So right here, in her hair, it's pretty soft over here. So I see some softness in the edge here, right? But then it's like real hard edge over here. So I'm going to use my freehand shield here. And I'm going to, I'm going to go parallel here. Because uh, in certain instances, it's okay to break the rules. That's for sure. Uh, let's see. Those Australian guys are pretty cool. I think it was started by uh, Mitch Lowther, who has Airbrush Forum, which is Airbrush Tutor, which is a lot of fun. He's a hilarious guy. You know, his videos are still doing very well. Really cool. Really good artist. Great artist, I should say. Miss Mitch Lowther. So. He started the airbrush, the orange airbrush forum, and I don't know if he's still on there every now and then. If you do see him, please tell him I said hello. Great guy. So Todd said, let me see, Todd says, oh, we pushed send, okay. Um, 
So where to put the white as far as the, uh, you know, with the portraits? Is that what you mean, Todd? I'd be happy to answer that question if you have, you know, I'm not sure I understand it just yet. So I have the dark mixture in this airbrush, and the other one is the medium mixture. And that's why, you know, when you go from the mid to the end part, which right now we're at the end game. Willie, how's it going? Good to see ya. Um, so, you know, you really want to, you really want to have a two airbrush system in the middle and the end because you don't want to try and, and do anything uh, with a different mixture. So let's say you just have one airbrush and you're in the medium mixture and you see, oh, there's a light shadow here. I don't want you to try and get that with the medium mixture. I want you to be able to get that with the light mixture. When you get to the end game, when you have the dark mixture just as here, I wouldn't want to see you try and do some subtle shading that you can do much better with the medium mixture. You know what I mean? So that's important. Oh, he stepped down. Okay. I hope he's doing well. Hey, Willie, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And those guys are from Australia, and they're some, they're really great guys, number one, and they're hilarious, as you guys have mentioned. So I have my dark mixture in, and let's see if we could go ahead and do some really nice dark accents here. And let's do that right here with the nostril. And I'm just going to keep until I find the actual edge that I'm comfortable with. And here, perpendicular and not parallel is absolutely crucial. See that? And then we get that sort of nice, nice dimension with that nostril. This nostril is much lighter, so I'm not going to touch it with the medium mixture, with the dark or the medium mixture. Todd, I would love to see, you know, and uh, remember, as long as we're learning, nothing's a really a mess up. So it's all part of our airbrush journey. And I want you to look at that. Oh, Shane says, Letty says, hi. Oh, thanks, Shane. How you doing? So good to talk to you. Thank you so much, Shane. So that's very cool. And now, Shane, you're all the way in Texas, if I'm not mistaken, correct? And the great state of Texas, so that's exciting. So we have our Texas people in Pennsylvania, the UK, uh, San Diego. <laughs> and thank you so much uh, about the painting, Shane. I really appreciate that, sir. That makes me feel good. You know, you guys all support me, and that makes me feel happy. And uh, you know, it's just, it's just great. These live streams are more for me, I think, than for everyone else. I think they're just like uh, tonic to my soul. Lee says he had quite a few beers with Mitch when he has been, oh, how cool. So that must have been a lot of fun. Yeah, Mitch is uh, really hilarious. Oh, Letty's on a call. That's cool. Okay. <laughs> That's neat. Hey, Patrick. Oh, wow. So, Patrick, you're from Montreal. Great. Fantastic. And then we have uh, uh, Bradley. He's from Manitoba. And that's really great. The center part of Canada. So, very neat. We have a, a nice, a nice uh, mix of, of people from all over. But doesn't matter where you're from. You're all so nice. So, you know, with Salmo, we just, we have the dark mixture. So right now what we're trying to do is just to get some volume with her. And I don't want to get too involved with hair because the whole live stream could be about hair. And I think that would be very boring. But 
I'll just show you in certain areas with the dark, we can just get some of, we're going to go and sort of zoom in here, and I'll show you that hair is really abstract. Uh, you have to think that it's not hair, but you have to think of it as just abstract shapes. And when you do that and just see abstract shapes, what happens is it starts looking like hair. And it's really weird, but if you want to paint hair correctly, you have to not paint hair. You have to paint the shapes. And they're going in all different directions, and they're all different sizes. And there's little darks and the lights. And really, the one second rule is really crucial in this case, you know? And so Lee says he's starting to feel the early morning because it's like, what, 3.30 in the morning over there in the UK? And really appreciate you hanging out with us. And thank you so much for that. And I hope you have a great night, Lee. And uh, cheers, mate. So thank you so much. I appreciate that, sir. Yes, Patrick, people here from everywhere, which is so, so cool. Um, you know, it's really, what's really funny is that we all think we don't have accents until we're around people who aren't, uh, you know, from our area. So before I went to college, I never left the New York area. And then I went away to college and there were people from Canada and different parts of the States. And they all said, wow, Tim, you have, a, you have an accent. And I'm like, no, I don't have an accent. You guys have an accent. <laughs> I thought that was funny. So while I'm here in the hair, let's go ahead and work on this eye and just deepen her eye a little bit, some of the values. And let's see if we can do some really cool eyelashes. Make sure you get rid of any tip dry or anything that would impede your ability to get detail. Now one of the things I do when I want an eyelash, so this is good for you guys to see, you always start with a dot, right? So you always start with a dot and then you fade up. See that? So you start with a dot and then you fade up. Start with a dot, start with a dot and fade up. And that's what I practice. Start with a dot and fade up. Start with a dot and fade up. And that's how you're going to get really good eyelashes, you know? So Todd says, uh, did you see his message on how the, the feed bar went backwards? No, I didn't. I didn't see that. And uh, Oh, the feed bar. Yeah, that's weird, huh? I'm not sure why that happened. And Patrick says for him it looks like the World Body Painting Festival in Australia. Oh, wow, that's really great. So have you you been there to the World Body Painting Festival? I just saw this show called Skin Wars, which I thought was really fascinating. Have you seen that, where they have the body painting, uh, sort of the reality contest? What I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to the media mixture real fast to do this uh, real delicate eyelash. Oh, since 2009, that's really great. And I'm just going to test this out. So you see the media mixture is much more subtle. And so, you know, there's a time and a place for the dark mixture and a time and a place for the media mixture. And this is definitely media mixture time over here. Oh, Craig is one of your jury in Austria. How cool is that? Wow. Yeah, that's a great show. It's on Netflix now. 
and I got I almost I'm at the championships or the the final round of season one, and I have to find time to finish that. I'm just gonna darken this right here. It's amazing. So this is the extreme, Patty. This is the extreme Patriot Arrow, and the good thing about the extreme Patriot Arrow is that you can modify it. I made some modifications. So this thing actually paints like a custom Micron. It's really great. And it's less than $100, which is really fantastic. Okay, so let's zoom in on eye number two over here and see if there's any detail we can achieve. That's not here. And again, you see I can one second rule, really paying attention, not what I want to see or what I think is there, but what's actually there, you know? Right here, it's a little bit dark, so we want to get that. Well, some of the things I do with the arrow, uh, I, I've changed a, a lot of things, such as got rid of the trigger. I went ahead and modified the pack valve, and I did modifications with the needle. So there's a lot of different modifications uh, that I do. I change the back from what comes with it to the backing of the sotar but I got rid of the uh, dial at the end because with this here, let me zoom out, with this here, so now I can get to that needle very quickly. And let me see if I have, so this is a regular one that I haven't totally modified yet. And you can see it has the regular backing, but look when I went ahead and did this backing, I can go ahead and get that needle and pull it out, change the needle, uh, whatever, real fast. But with this, I would have to take it off. Plus, sometimes this actually will have some friction against this, but you see how free the needle is. And I like the fact that the needle is very free. So that's another one of the changes I made, you know? Uh, but yeah, it's... The fact that with Badger you can make changes is really fantastic. And I've made changes from painting uh, six to eight hours a day every day for, for years. For Actually, I've been painting with the Extreme Patriot Hour for two years now. So that's a lot of hours to really figure out what's great about it, what can be improved. And so that's, that's where we are with that, which is, you know, very cool. And uh, so, yeah, so there are still some other changes I'm probably make down the line, but right now um, I really tuned this really down, uh, tuned it up. And I also have the Mac valve, which I can make large. So I have 25 PSI at the, at the compressor and I can make large, adjustments from the 25 PSI, PSI and then here I can even make more micro adjustments if I'm going with tight detail and I want to adjust for spidering or even going and getting the stipple, stippling method so there's a lot of different things you can do uh, with this setup that I have it's really cool my guess, I think it is. I think I'm not going to do a part six, and I'm not going to finish her tonight, but I think I'm definitely going to uh, go with, a, you know, start, start part one of a different portrait next week. I think so. And Okay, so now that we got some nice detail here, let's see if we could start using the white pastel. So what I like to do is I take the Pit Pastel, like all my art supplies that I use, there's a link in the description, 
or you can go to my website and the website I'm going to write it down for you paintedglyphs.com and there you'll see all the different supplies that I use and uh, I can get that out to you which is very cool rather than you have to look for it even down to the gloves I would have them on the site for you so it's very cool sort of a one-stop shop uh, oh the water trap on the compressor either I didn't I very rare oh thank you Patty um, now I didn't uh, I never use a water trap. I mean, it's something did happen for the first time with all the hours that I did. I did have an issue, uh, I think on Saturday, where there was a excess of water that came out and it was quite scary. It didn't destroy my work, just scared me there for a second. But I find that the when you have larger compressors, that, now this is only my own findings, that it's so rare to happen that I don't usually worry about a water trap. You guys find something different? Do you guys have that more or less? Now, my my compressor does not it does have a regulator uh, with a clear uh, bottom on it. Um, I think so. The larger one does, not the smaller one. The larger one, the older one, has that, but not the smaller one. I have a five gallon and I have an eight gallon, and the eight gallon comes with a water trap. But, you know, I think it's a good idea. I mean, what if it does destroy your artwork, right? You know, and then, and that would be, you know, horrifying. So I had a scare, it didn't destroy my work. But yes, it, it does happen. Water, there's like condensation where the, the, the air it's sucking in is probably hotter and the air that's inside the tank is colder and when that happens there's moisture and that could shoot out through your air hose into your airbrush and onto your work. So that is quite frightening. So again, when we're working at this stage, we want to, uh, that's our goal, is to make things three-dimensional. Not three-dimensional arbitrarily, but three-dimensional as they are. So when I'm looking at, let's zoom in on her nostril, for instance. Okay, so here's her nostril. And it's not just a hole in her head. It is a hole in her head, but there is more going on there. So we want to make sure that we get some of the subtle value changes that happens as light is going through the air and bouncing off of the outside of her nostril and not getting into the inner part of her nostril. So let's move this over. Now here's interesting, you can see some little, tiny little spidering that shows up when I blow it up, but to the naked eye it doesn't show up. So I don't get concerned with that. A lot of people use those magnifying glasses when painting, and I think that's cool, but I don't want you to get too hung up on what you see with the magnifying glasses, because, uh, okay, so yeah, so, Mine doesn't come with it. I'm going to double check. Let me see. My compressor's right here. No, nope, mine doesn't have it. Maybe your model, since it's newer, uh, has it, but my model doesn't. So that's cool. Yes, the larger one does come with it, that's for sure. But I think the smaller ones don't. So now we're working on this nostril here of Selma.
everything on Salma is gorgeous. And so what we're doing now is we're really trying to find what's happening with the light. So light's coming right now. I would say if we look at the cast shadow, see how the cast shadow's over here and there's no cast shadow here. So the light, there's a couple of light sources, but the main one's coming from above and to the left. So that means that anything that is below and to the right is going to be facing the light. And you see just here, light is catching this under area of her nostril there. Same thing right here. Lights, but here's the thing. This is a different light source over here. So the photographer did it. So it kind of goes against the regular laws of nature. And that's where the one second rule comes from too because not everything's always going to be Rembrandt lighting, you know, one light source. So you have to be very mindful of what you're seeing. And these gloves are really great because they keep my hands and my the hand the oils from my hands getting onto the surface and changing the surface. And you'll see that once the oils get on the, on your hands, it really will uh, accept the ink differently and also the white pastel differently. So wearing these gloves do go a long way to keeping you from you know creating a mess. Now Shane says, is that an 11 by 14 canvas? Great question. It is uh, like a cardstock paper. The size is uh, eight and a half by 11. And, and Shane, I love this paper because it has a nice thickness to it. As you can see, it's, it's almost like, like uh, cardboard, right? And it has just a slight texture. On this side, it has a harder texture, but on this side is a smoother texture. So it has enough texture to accept the ink but it's, uh, it's still relatively smooth. If it was too smooth, like Bristol, it wouldn't have that quality of absorbing the ink. You know, it, it's like, uh, you know, uh, tablet uh, paper, you know, like uh, for calligraphy. It just has the right amount of absorption ability to uh, really make the ink uh, really stand out, but also uh, not beat on the surface. So that's why I like this. I like the size of eight and a half by 11, because when I was a kid growing up in New York, I would do my artwork on the dining room table and I didn't have a lot of room. So all those years in true high school and every junior high school and high school, uh, I just got used to that size. I have worked really huge but I always like working small, especially doing live streams like this so you can see the whole uh, picture, you know? Uh, so, uh, so James says he always loves to experiment and expand. That's great, you know, it's important to always push your boundaries and, and go as, uh, you know, push your boundaries is always important, right? Not only that, it's in, it's important to um, try different things, you know, uh, working large or maybe on irregular surfaces might be uh, what you'll be known for, what works for you best. So it's always important to do that. Yes, a little goes a long way, definitely. Okay, so as you see, we worked on her nostril a little bit, and you see there's a little bit of white there. Let me show you. So with the white pastel, if you ever have too much, you can just take your kneaded eraser. The great thing about kneaded erasers is that you could bend it into any shape, and then just tap that. Really, really cool, you know? And Shane says he would like that picture if possible. Uh, oh, you mean... This painting? Really? Shane, that would be amazing. Definitely. So, um, she is for sale. And so, that's 
that's pretty cool, you know? Wow, I appreciate that. So uh, I'll definitely, uh, I'll definitely uh, leave my email address and let's see. So my email address, Shane, is paintedglyphs at gmail.com. Okay. <laughs> Stop the bidding. <laughs> oh no, I, that that's okay. I, I would not I would not want to have bidding wars. That would be then the price would be uh, I don't want the price to go too high, you know. It's funny, I did have somebody in Latin America ask about that. But they didn't. They didn't say they they really wanted it, so they didn't they didn't get it. But my price is, uh, you know, for friends, is really low as those who have bought my paintings here. So I try and, uh, you know, give you guys good rates. You know, but I really appreciate that. Thank you, Shane. So as you can see, we want to make her as three-dimensional as possible, right? And But we also want to see the subtleties of, of her features. So right here, it's just a little bit of light here that comes down. And then just a, a turn. There we go. My guest says, if anyone wants something heavier than printer paper, he uses uh, the inside of Cheerio boxes. And for, oh wow, that's pretty cool. Interesting, so Shane says, uh, do I use clay to smooth out, uh, to smooth out the edges and fade the painting? Uh, Interesting, so sort of like, uh, so I, that's a technique I don't know about, Shane. So uh, so as far as clay, I basically, with the airbrush, is if I want to smooth out an edge, I just increase my distance. So let's say if I'm over here, and we're working on her hair right here. And right now I have the media mixture in the airbrush. So let's say it's nice and dark, but I want it to be a more of a fade and lighter color. I'll increase my distance from one inch to maybe four inches. And as you can see, I can get a really wonderful gradation. So uh, it's really distant that does the most. And the airbrush is great because you can really soften those edges really well, which is the beauty of airbrush. You know, every medium, I've been working like 30 years in pastel, and I think around 10 years ago, I started picking up airbrush, actually nine years ago. And when I did that, there were things that I found that airbrush could do that other mediums can't. And every, every medium's like that. So uh, that's one of the great things of getting those soft edges with, uh, the soft edges with the airbrush and the fades, it's really the best part of airbrushing, I think, definitely. And Brad says, if you guys don't have any Tim's art, I highly recommend it. Oh, thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. Yeah, I just uh, sent a painting to Brad, right? And it arrived in one piece in Cat to Canada. And that was pretty cool. So. Brad, Brad is a newly a new collector of my work, and the live streams are, are pretty cool because you can I keep the live streams up on there and, and you could see uh, the progression of the painting that you own and just people are seeing them you know I think like six thousand people an average of six thousand people watch my videos every month not one particular video but you know watch the videos on my channel every month so it's pretty neat you know to own a painting that basically is out there and people are watching it from all over the world it's, it's really neat 
So Shane says when he did portraits with pencil, he used clay to fade out the darker spots. Really? So how would you use clay? I would really love to hear that. So do you uh, use clay, like rub it against it? That's interesting. I know I use Conti crayon, but I've never used clay. So that's, that's really cool. Did you learn that from uh, an art teacher or something like that? Or is it something that you pretty much discovered yourself? Right here, it's a little bit darker on her nose. And also, Willie owns a painting of mine. And that's really cool. So, I appreciate that, Willie, very much. And also, Mr. Johnson, he owns a painting, uh, which is really great, and I appreciate that so much. So, uh, we do have several collectors here of my work, so that's exciting. But I really appreciate you guys' support in every way, you know? Oh, so moist clay, and uh, so when you were in the military, it was a pastime in boot camp. How cool is that? Oh, that's really nice. Nice to hear. Wow, so that is very interesting. So it kind of smooths out or fades out the graphite. Very interesting. So Chris says, eat the Cheerios and then, and then paint it. Paint the box, huh? That's funny. Well, eating them is pretty good, but when I was a kid, I was always upset when my mom got Cheerios because there were much more exciting cereals out there, like Count, uh, Count Chocula and uh, all those monster cereals. I mean, they were really garbage, but my mom would very rarely get them. And uh, I think like on my birthday, she would get them for me. But she got the healthy ones. Cornflakes and stuff like that. Oh my God, that was the worst. You know? <laughs> Don't get crumbs on your paint. Yeah, the Cheerios crumbs, that's bad. But your painting will be low in cholesterol, I believe. And heart healthy. So as you see, I'm going to go back in with the dark mixture right now. I had the light mixture. It adds to the price of peace. Booberry, that's right. That was toxic, wasn't it, Willie? I mean, it made the cereal blue, but not a normal blue that, that should be anywhere nearly consu consumed, right? That was like some sort of chemistry project. Oh, my goodness. Do they still sell blue? I think I've seen a commercial for them. I guess now since we're getting towards Halloween, right? But yeah, that was crazy. Blueberry. <laughs> so what, what are some of the most unhealthy cereals you remember that they got away with selling as a kid? I don't know. So I would have to say those monster cereals, of course, they were pretty horrible. was one with a bear on it was like super sugar crisp or something it was like sugar on sugar and that was pretty frightening that that was actually uh it's still out there oh my god captain crunch was nasty especially with those crunch berries which was basically orange sugar right <laughs> orange balls of pure sugar Yes, that was definitely not a good cereal. Uh, it basically was candy in the, you know, with milk. It really was quite frightening. So as you can see, with the dark mixture, I'm able to continue getting some of those uh, nice contrasts in certain areas. And that really creates interest.
right here where her scalp and I'm going to put in some some hairs using the white font and porter right here and I can go in there later and get those really sharp hairs the light hairs So you see this area which was pretty dull, I'm starting to get some interest. Oh, the Smurf cereal. Yeah, that was nasty. Frosted Flakes was really good, but there was far too much sugar for that to be healthy in any way. But yeah, the um, Smurf cereal, that was super sugar crisp. That's what it was, James. That was so horrifyingly bad. Yeah, Wendy's not here tonight. That's a bummer. The sugar bear. Yeah, that was not good. I did have many bowls of that. I think when my dad went shopping, you know, we were able to coax him to get us stuff like that. But my mom was like, no way. That's not happening. And my little sister, she's not little anymore, but she was the fifth child of five kids. So she got away with stuff we didn't get away with. So she always had, you know, any cereal she wanted. And with us, it was like, there was no, no, no way around it. You know, it was like, it was Cheerios or Kicks or some horribly tasting stuff such as that. Fruit Loops, yeah, that, that was scary. Back then, now they try to make it more healthy, but back then it was just sugar on sugar. So if you notice when I paint hairs, I'm not painting the hair all the way up, just sort of stagger it, because that's what hair does. It just, you'll see a hair here, and then another hair will come up over here and it just sort of staggers because there's a lot of layers of hair and some create shadows, some create lights, right? So that's what we're doing. See how we're creating and then we keep going in there and keep refining as we go. So right now what I'm doing is a lot of dark accents here and there. Uh, here would be, so you would use your freehand shield of course to keep, when you're doing this, to keep having any overspray from the airbrush touching her her skin, you know, or, you know, darkening her skin. So you would use it right there, just like that. Perpendicular, not parallel. Definitely, that's the rule. There are some exceptions to the rule which are rare but always perpendicular, not parallel, except for the rare exceptions. I think one of the rare exceptions when you're actually painting an individual hair, you will see that, but only then. Okay, so if we look at the reference, we'll see that it's really dark here, then lightens up and then gets dark over here. So, but it really maintains a kind of hard edge. So I'm going to take my freehand shield, make sure I wipe it on a shirt I don't care about too much. And I'm going to cover the hair, I'm going to cover the chin, and then I'm just going to go perpendicular and not parallel, just to where I want to go, right here, and not over here like that. So that's important. So remember, and also I'm seeing too much contrast over here, so I can take my dark mixture from a good distance. And I can dust over, and what it does, it just calms down the contrast, and then makes the hair look like more like it belongs to the rest of the atmosphere, right? And then we'll come back in with some of the lights later. So that's pretty cool. So also known as hooters. Okay, see this is when you come in later in a conversation. When I haven't seen the rest, and I see also known as hooters, that means that there was some interesting conversation <laughs> when I wasn't looking. So Fruit Loops and then 
Mikey from Life Cereal. Sometimes I think everything is bad for uh, for Wendy. And Mike S. says, yeah, do I like life and beer and whiskey and big owls that giggle a lot? And Chris says, okay. And then says, also known as Hooters. Okay, so that's where we're going. And then Air Todd says, Tim, you should do something ghoulish for Halloween stream. Wow, and maybe my bank account? That would just paint that? That that's, that will scare the daylights out of everybody. And then, uh, Air, and then uh, Willie says, Living is number one cause of death. <laughs> and then my guest says, oh, Willie, I think you hit something profound there. And uh, that's hilarious. Yeah, I got to get the Hooters. Definitely. I haven't been to one of them. Definitely got to try it. But after the pandemic, because I don't think the Hooda girls look all that cute if they're in hazmat outfits, right? So, and, uh, so they'll throw the food at you. <laughs> You'll see them from behind the counter as they throw a hamburger at you. Oh my goodness. Okay, so we're doing pretty good here. And we're in the, almost at the 11 o'clock hour. So I always do the live stream for two hours. I always give you guys the full two hours when I can, unless there's something else, you know. So, Patty's <laughs> laughing. Uh, we were there to look at their faces, Tim. Oh, of course, definitely. Yeah, but now they're covered, you know? So they're covered up, Chris. And, you know, I can't see their faces. So that's not good. Right? So that's a bad thing. So I gotta wait until at least there's a cure, right? To go there. So that that delays my first Hooters visit visit already. So even more. Okay, so now we're going to go back to our medium mixture and let's see if we could just uh, model the face a little bit. Model, model his face a little bit. You wouldn't want to do this with the dark mixture, it's too harsh. So you definitely want to uh, be very subtle here. And if you want like something a lot lighter, you can just increase your distance. I want you all to work in three dimensions, okay? The airbrush, you don't touch the surface with the airbrush, but you actually paint with a cone of air with paint particles, and in our case, ink particles. So when you increase the distance, you make the cone larger and softer. And so that's why uh, when you want to uh, have a smoother, more delicate area, you can increase the distance of the airbrush to the surface. So that's pretty good. Shane told me a new technique with clay is really fantastic. I definitely got to look into that, sir. That's really cool. That's the great thing about art. You never stop learning, right? That's, we never ever stop learning. So looking at her teeth, I could see that, you know, she has beautiful white teeth, but they are gray in comparison to white. So you definitely want to, uh, so Willie says, if we go to a strip club, do girls have masks on? I would say so, right? Definitely. You know, I would hope so. There would be, you know, how do you say, um, healthy, right? Definitely. Patty says she hates to, but she needs to go to bed. Uh, our morning will come soon. Thank you so much, Patty. Always a pleasure. And uh, let me know how your project's coming along. If you have any questions, I'm always happy to help. So I really appreciate your time, Patty. Thank you. And... Oh, you guys are hilarious. All 
right, so um, I'm just going to work on some of the subtlety here. Let's go back to our teeth. Now, now that I went ahead and grayed out the teeth, I can take my white pastel and zo really zoom into my reference photo. And I'm going to go ahead and start to paint some of the value differences in her, her teeth here. And they're very subtle changes. But these changes will make a huge difference. And you really, when it comes to teeth, you have to get it right. You know, you have to get the angles of her teeth correctly. Just a little, a little variation to the left or right could definitely make a big difference. Oh, cool. So Shane says, uh, you have good shading in the teeth. It looks like it's glistening in the light when you were zoomed in. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Yeah, and you know, there's hardly any white in there. That's what's really cool is that, you know, just a little bit of, uh, a little bit of a lighter value gives the impression of white teeth. Because in reality, I don't think, uh, you know, we would want white teeth because uh, it would look unnatural. And as I paint teeth, I find that they're more gray with lighter highlights, you know? That's what I'm finding. Oh, 4 a.m. That's early, Patty. Oh, boy. So definitely, you need your rest. I appreciate you staying up this long with us. Thank you. And you see, her teeth are still very gray. If we zoom in, they're still very gray with just a little bit of a highlight here and there, which really isn't a very powerful highlight anyway. And just a little bit lighter here. So less is definitely more in this case. And while we're here, let's put some of the glistening in her, her, her teeth here, uh, her lips. And the lights are a little more powerful in her lips in this picture. And what you do is you'll just uh, with the white pastel, when you use this, you just want to pull off some of the white pastel with the sandpaper. It's medium grade sandpaper, so it actually pulls a lot of that pastel off. And then I use a paper stump, which is normally for shading, for drawing, and that works very well. And basically, you're using the white pastel like a paintbrush, right? It's not really using the pencil. And also, the pencil would be too harsh. So using the white pastel is with the stump, you have much more control. And that makes a big difference when you're trying to do subtlety such as, you know, you know, little variations of value in the teeth and in the nostril and just moving around like so, you know. So all these little changes really go a long way. So right here, the chin is this part of her chin is catching just a little bit more of the light, so we're going to apply a little bit more right there. And you want to sort of rub that pastel into the surface, right? You don't want to just, you know, dab it on. You want to really dig it in there and we can go in there and 
and make some really nice uh, gradations and everything. So right here, I could actually just sort of scumble this in to put some light in those shadows. And you'll see when I do that. And, and what you also do is you soften the edges of, let's say, that cast shadow. And then give more, more uh, luminous qualities to uh, certain passages of light on her face. So Bradley says, good night, got to get up early too. Thank you so much, Brad, I appreciate it. Thank you for hanging out with me. And uh, don't work too hard, and I'm going to contact you about that portrait. So uh, so definitely you'll hear from me either tomorrow or Friday, Brad, okay? So that's cool. And so thank you, Bradley, I really appreciate that. So that was nice. It was always great to see Bradley. And... So let's zoom in on her Cupid's bow. I love the Cupid's bow. Uh, I love the name. I think it's adorable. And so what's interesting, when you have a dark, right, or, you know, an area that is indented and it creates a dark, what happens is that you're going to have a corresponding light. And I'm going to show you. So here's the dark of her Cupid's bow, right? right there and I accentuate a little bit but that's only that's great it's only half the story but you're gonna have a corresponding highlight right against it because what's going in is going to jut up uh, in the other direction and that's gonna face the light so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put that in and you see once I do that it really gives more dimension to that Cupid's bow. So you see this, this light that comes down, just like so. And then it just gets a little bit darker after that. So we're gonna stay a good distance away and we're just gonna dust that. And then we'll dust that back. Oh, Shane, have a great night, my friend. It's so amazing to to uh, meet you and hang out. And uh, I really appreciate that. And uh, email me about the painting when you get a chance. It's uh, paintingglyphs at gmail.com. And we'll go over a really good price for you and see about uh, getting it to you uh, ASAP, okay? And uh, once again, Great to meet you, Shane. Thank you so much. I hope to see you again. I'm here every Wednesday. I always love to hang out with good people like yourself, sir. Like I said, that's the whole reason I do this, to help people and to meet great people. I mean, I think that's the... Is there anything better in life, right? I don't think so. And let's see where else I could. Okay, right here. See how there's there's a cast shadow by the bottom part of her nose? And that's important. And I missed that. And I think that's going to make a big difference in her likeness as well. So my guest says, business probably has picked up in that area for him. Uh, what area is that, my friend? Oh, you're talking about the uh, Ryan Townsend artist. Okay, I understand. Okay. All right, so it's a little bit darker. Even though I'm with the medium mixture, I can put in the dark over here. And right over here. All right. So let's just continue trying to make things turn. There we go. 
we'll zoom out again. Perfect, okay. Now I didn't like what I did with the cubit's bow, so I'm just gonna erase that and we're gonna try that again. Uh, maybe come back in with the Fonz and Porter would probably be a better, better route. Who was it? It was John Singer Sargent who once said that he was a, one of the greatest portrait painters ever in the uh, late, late uh, 19, early 20th century. And he said a portrait painting is, is uh, you know, a picture of someone with something slightly wrong with the nose. And it's interesting because it is really hard to paint a portrait because, especially someone you know, because you have to get their likeness. And not only that, you have to try and get, you know, part of their personality that they people know and recognize. So it's really difficult. That's one of the hardest things. I think landscape painting is really cool and I love it, but it's nothing in complexity when painting a portrait, I feel. Right? I definitely don't think so. There we go. And let's create a nice hard edge here. Now what's interesting is the reference doesn't have that much, uh, doesn't have a lot of information. So I can't make things turn like I did with the Amy Lee painting, or let's say with uh, some of the other paintings I'm working on. So let me show you a case in point. Here's another painting I'm working on where I have a little more information from the photograph. And you can see that, you know, with a little more information, I can make things turn even more. But, you know, everything has its pluses and minuses. And you see I have more uh, variation of edges. So it's a little more of a progressive technical piece here than this one, which is really a beautiful reference, but you don't have that wiggle room to change values and whatnot. But here, you know, since it's a formal portrait, we really have to, uh, really have to watch and make sure that we, we capture her likeness, right? That's the most important thing when it comes to painting well-known celebrities and great, per, you know, great people like Salma Hayek. Well, I'm not a custom painter. Good question, Mike. Mike asked if I paint on anything but uh, cardstock. I've been painting for since 19, I've been painting formally, formally since 1982. Actually, before then, when I was 15, I started painting formally. So I worked on everything from canvas to illustration board to canvas board to uh, all kinds of paper to wood panels, wood panels using marble dust, wood panels using uh, pumice and gesso. I painted on aluminum panels a couple of times. I don't see the use for it unless you're a custom painter and you want to practice on aluminum. Otherwise, it's just an inferior surface. Um, but yeah, so I've been painting on everything. Uh, like I said, like all those years of experience, I don't work in color. I've only really started working in uh, cardstock and airbrush, what is it, three years ago, Willie? Uh, before that, I did mostly just drawings with cardstock. But uh, if I was going to look at all the things that I've worked on, cardstock is probably one of the least things that I've worked on as far as how many things I've done. Uh, my preferred surface uh, has always been uh, masonite with my own mixture of gesso and marble dust. And let's see if I can show you a few examples of using that here. So this is a painting that I did with uh, gesso and marble dust. And you can see it's pretty cool. And that's airbrush, of course. That's not pastel. And then we have this painting, which I did on masonite. 
and that is done with uh, India ink, of course. And then I have this painting over here, and this is something I'm still working on, almost done. This is actually on uh, my own masonite with masonite with my own marble dust and gesso mixture. So you know, as far as surfaces, I don't think I'm second to anyone with as far as knowledge to surfaces. I mean, you have guys like Ryan Townsend. I'm sure you can pick how many surfaces he used and how many surfaces I used, and I would probably triple him with the amount of experience I have on different surfaces. I worked on Belgian linen. I worked on all different kinds of canvases, from the ones that you get at Michael's to the canvases that cost you, like, you know, hundreds of dollars. So... Uh, I worked with rabbit skin glue. I worked with gesso. So, I mean, the amount of surfaces that I've worked on will pretty much blow away most people because, face it, I did eight years of art school. Now, not just any art school, but the best art schools ever. I was blessed with that. So, and I'm very happy my parents helped me get that. And so I'm thankful for them for every day. Thank you for uh, all the wonderful things that, uh, and the, the wonderful art teachers I was able, I was very blessed and lucky living in New York, just lucky. But with that luck came a lot of knowledge and a lot of hard work to get that knowledge from those teachers. So, you know, when you talk about a lot, when we talk about a lot of people and they're working on wood, they're working on metal or cars, it's, it's really cool, but it really is, there's a lot more surfaces out there that they haven't even touched on because they have a different background, fine art background that I have, you know? Like, my marble dust and gesso mixture has been handed down from generation to generation from all the way back to 19th century French academic painters from painter to student, painter to student to me when Harvey Dinnerstein uh, gave me that uh, marble dust gesso mixture which is really cool and so it's interesting you know it's interesting about surfaces or substrates uh, you know how how you know to work and you know all these different surfaces and there's a real science to it right and you have to really you really have to know your surface and if you're lucky enough to have a good teacher who can actually tell you what to expect with that surface but it's really just the experience of playing with it and knowing what you like one of the things I do like about the gesso and marble dust mixture on the wood panel I would uh, I definitely, uh, with the wood panel and the gesso marble dust, you can adjust it for the amount of uh, texture and or the least amount of texture, which is really fantastic. So they held me back ninth grade seven times. Why do you say that, my friend? Thanks, James. The science is really fantastic, you know. Uh, with the the blessings that I did have, uh, you know, the way that I was, the way that I, uh, my, my classes were structured, really was uh, five days a week, eight, uh, five days a week for six, six hours a day. The teachers would come by twice a week. We would paint live from the model. We would learn oil painting and pastel and watercolor and pan and ink and all these other uh, different surfaces, you know? That's why I was so good in art school. <laughs> well, it was pretty cool. I, you know, um, you know, I was able to go to an art high school, which was like six periods of art a day, and that was exciting. and. Then I went to college to study art history and learn about the artists who 
uh, that would give me direction of where I wanted to go as far as technically. And what really helped was the study of oil painting and learning about that, you know, which is really fantastic. Not freaking out, Mike. Just letting you know that I know a lot more than just paper. You know what I mean? So, you know, that's... Do I work just on paper? And I'm not freaking out. I'm just letting people know, letting everyone know that, you know, I've been doing this for many, many years. And I've worked on every single surface imaginable. Uh, more surfaces than anyone I know. So, for me to pick a surface like this is because I know it's a really good surface from from uh, it's a really fantastic surface because I know all the other surfaces and what needs to uh, what kind of surface you need to actually have something work for a particular uh, you know a, a very particular uh, medium such as India ink you know you have to have that absorption so, Chris asks, what does PSA mean after my name? I'm a signature member of the Pastel Society of America. And uh, so, to be a signature member of the Pastel Society of America is that you have to be elected by the members of the Pastel Society of America. They do a portfolio review. You also have to win an award for three years uh, to actually be considered at their Grand National Show or their uh, uh, they have an international juried art competition every year so you have to have at least three awards from them to be considered and then once you that happens you have to send them your artwork and then the board members of the Pastel Society of America will give you signature status and only then can you put PSA at the at the back of your name so that's it's a really prestigious honor and I don't take it lightly you know thanks Brad I appreciate that So yeah, I the paper is just something that I like for the live streams. It's it's really great. It's portable. I it's a great size. It's it's not bulky and that's one of the reasons why I like it as well. Plus it's inexpensive. And you see now that I have the uh, eraser here. And once you get really dark, you'll see that the, the ink, once you have the dark mixture, it really erases very well. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate that, sir. Okay, so over here, you'll see that you have, you still have to do the one second rule. Wow, so your your teacher was, was deaf? Was that a hard, it must have been difficult uh, communicating uh, with her, you know, unless she was, uh, you know, very good at explaining things, so that must have been rough, though. I mean, I'm sure, you know, I don't, I think, you know, that's, that's rough, you know. Oh, okay, so Mike also got bad deals from his teachers. Well, I think someone has to love to help people and love to teach and love what they're teaching. 
and that's when they do good things and help people. It's not about anything, but uh, so she was hard of hearing. Oh, I see. Uh, Willie says he doesn't care if I work on toilet paper. <laughs> Thank you, Willie. I appreciate that, my friend. So look how we can definitely start to uh, create more volume with her hair, which is great. And we're still going to come back. So I definitely would come back in with this, you know. Brad says he's old and deaf, so it must be hard for Tim. Not at all, Brad. You're, you're a breeze to teach, you know. You're a great student. So Brad is one of my current students. And he's doing some incredible work. He's in my mentorship program. And that's available after you take my workshop. So once you take my online workshop, then you can move on to the, uh, the mentorship program, which is really cool. Well, that's true. There is a TP shortage, right? That's, that would be interesting. I, I think right now I'm finding a hard time uh, paper towels. That's that's something that, and I need paper towels for the st for the studio. I'm sure everyone does, you know, especially when, you know, cleaning your airbrush. Paper towels are crucial. So you see, we still have work to do with this, but this is going to be the last episode with Salma Hayek. Use toilet paper? Oh my God, that would be scary. That's that's frightening. Okay, so I have my media mixture, and let's see if I can uh, just darken this area a little bit. Actually, I need to put more media mixture in here. That's true, yes. Used toilet paper is definitely a bad idea all around, Mike. Ah, oh, Willie said he'll miss she'll miss, he'll miss uh, Salma. Ah, oh, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Yeah, she's this is a great live stream. I had fun painting painting Salma, you know? And um, it's all the beginning, right? A good start. I think, I think a good start is crucial. What do you guys think about? Do you find when you have a good start, it pretty much is uh, smoother sailing? Usually, when you have a good start, as opposed to a start that might be a little more difficult than normal. Do you guys find that? Chris says, who's next? Good question. I'm not sure. But I usually do a celebrity, but it's always cool to, you know, catch people who, you know, people recognize. So it might be a celebrity, but I'm not sure yet whether it will be Catherine Bell. That's a good idea. So, you know, we'll see what we can do, definitely. So that's cool. Well, guys, I'm going to cut off. I started at 928. So thank you guys for hanging out. I really appreciate you. I had a lot of fun tonight. And uh, so this has been Salma Hayek, part five and the final one. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate all your time. And I hope you have a great week. God bless you.